Baldur's Gate was released in 1998 to critical acclaim. That makes it 22 years old at the time of me making this retrospective video. It has even been 8 years since the enhanced edition of the game was re-released by Beamdog and Overhaul Studios. Baldur's Gate was created in the Infinity Engine that went on to be the home for many other acclaimed games of the genre, such as Planescape Torment, Icewind Dale, and this game's sequel, Baldur's Gate 2. I want to look back at this game since it is considered a classic and a defining game of its genre of isometric RPGs. My interest in playing through this game must have been high since I bought the enhanced edition of the game four years ago. I haven't got around to playing it until now. It wasn't chosen to be my first retrospective for these reasons, although it does make an interesting starting point. Instead, it is simply the game I was interested in at the time of creating this channel. I'm planning on doing a lot of retrospectives of a lot of RPGs, and a lot in the isometric and western RPG genres. I want to give credit to some inspirations for this video. I would like to credit the work of Chris Davis and Noah Caldwell-Gervais, who have already made videos about Baldur's Gate and the isometric RPG classics, including many Infinity Engine games. I also wanted to credit Joseph Anderson and Super Buddy Hop's George Weedman for their critique and analysis series that were also inspirations. I hope this video is taken as an extension of those videos since they inspired me to start this series. To say a quote attributed to Sir Isaac Newton, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Please check out their videos on the topic if you haven't already. I remember playing Baldur's Gate when I was in my teenage years. I had a cousin from across the country that came to visit who piqued my interest in Dungeons and Dragons. I fell in love with a lot of things about D&D. I could take my passion for learning and for exploration and have an outlet for it with my friends. I also have fond memories of going to my local game store and looking through the PC games on the shelves. Baldur's Gate had a special allure since it was linked to the Dungeons and Dragons and specifically the Forgotten Realms universes. The Forgotten Realms have been a part of my reading and playing habits throughout my life. I have read many stories from R.A. Salvatore, Ed Greenwood, and others. I enjoy having a connected universe that was bigger than even the Marvel Cinematic Universe of today. At that time, I was too young to connect with Baldur's Gate meaningfully. It was too overwhelming at the time for me to get hooked into its gameplay and story. D&D had me because it was something I did with friends. When I got off track, I could simply talk with friends about something else for a while, and they would loop me back in. The social experience of D&D allowed me the patience to read its rules and struggle through its difficulty with the help of my real-life party. The computer had no way to hook my attention at the time. Now that I'm older, my patience has grown, and unfortunately my time with friends has dwindled. Today I seem to have the combination of interest and patience to get hooked into Baldur's Gate, and it really hooked me this time. I remember when I got this game and opened the box, it really surprised me. It was so large at the time that it had to be spread out across five CDs for a single installation. This didn't include its expansion, Tales of the Sword Coast, which itself added another 20 hours worth of content on an extra CD. I imagined at the time that this game must be huge, the biggest I had ever seen compared to the single floppy disks that held most of my other games. Now playing the game 20 years later, I have to confirm this game is huge. I've played this game now for over 70 hours, and I haven't seen everything I could in this playthrough, let alone that I could see in the multiple playthroughs that this game intends. I will put the caveat that this was a slow playthrough. The game was often on pause when caring for my daughter, during study breaks, and when I needed to do things around the house. I would bet this playthrough could have been about 50 hours uninterrupted. That being said, this game has a depth and a scope that isn't often seen in games today. This is the first concept I wanted to explore. How did the developers make such a large game? Well, the game is large in that there are a lot of things to do and a lot of ways to do them. It is large in the sense that it has depth and true depth. It doesn't have miles and miles of territory to explore, although the map is quite large. What it does have is a lot of content within most of those maps. I remember watching a video about the creation of The Witcher 3, another great game in the Western RPG genre. The game was made with an in-house engine just like Baldur's Gate as well. The original development team consisted of 150 people, 250 in-house by the end of development, and this doesn't include contractors. There were artists who would go and create a map, then another artist would make a pass to add buildings, then more artists to add items to the buildings, all models being created in-house by hand. To contrast, Baldur's Gate was made by a team of just 60, most of whom had never created a game before. 
When Baldur's Gate was being produced, there wasn't the need for whole divisions of the company to make assets for the games, design UIs. Even the underlying rule set was designed already in the form of the second edition of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. This meant that the developers spent most of their time designing quests, maps, and storylines, allowing them to make a large world on a small budget. The focus was on the things that gave the game depth, such as multiple endings to each story or quest. The Witcher 3 similarly had this type of depth, but with the graphical assets, voice acting, and modern gameplay adding further layers of development complexity. The content the Baldur's Gate team created varies in terms of pacing and depth. Some quests are quite simple. A person had something bad happen and now they need you to solve their problem for them. Some quests go much deeper with branching plot lines and multiple paths. These plot lines, maps, and the slow pace of its gameplay lends to a huge experience. The game was made in the 90s on a budget that would be considered an indie studio today. The Baldur's Gate inspired isometric RPG Pillars of Eternity came out in 2015 and used many of the design elements of Baldur's Gate. This was not only to invoke nostalgia, but cut costs for the studio. The introduction to Baldur's Gate is a scrolling text with a narrator saving costly graphics budgets to animate an opening. All dialogue is based in text, and animations are limited to what a character needs to do for combat, and not necessarily speech or the story. Using these descriptive tactics of design evoke the player's imagination in a way that you also see in Dungeons & Dragons games or in fantasy novels in this genre. This may be one of the reasons I've never connected with a game as a teen. I have yet to build up the background needed for that level of imagination. The game forcing you to use your imagination shouldn't be taken as a negative here. This is a role-playing game based partially in your imagination after all. The developers can rely on you to make a character and a backstory, and to use your imagination to fill the role and choose actions of that character. Why couldn't they count on you to imagine how combat would look if it were fully animated? or what a thief using their skills would actually look like. If you have a rich imagination, the game can be a very fulfilling narrator. It is the ultimate choose-your-own-adventure novel, which brings us nicely to our next topic. The game story has a depth that allow your decisions to change the course of your game. If you make certain choices, it will affect how the rest of your game is shaped. These branching storylines were designed to encourage the player to play through the game multiple times, following multiple paths with different characters. At first, these permanent choices started to stoke anxiety in me. I worried about missing out on the possibility of interesting choices. As I get older and I play more games, I've tried to get rid of my completionist mindset. I find that it gets in the way of actually having fun with a game, and this was a good challenge to that mindset. I found myself just accepting the consequences of these choices and saying that if I was interested in seeing how it would crumble, I could always just play the game again if I think that would be fun. The most important choices many players will make, the ones that cause ripples through the rest of their game, are the choices they make in their character creation screen. Anyone familiar with creating a D&D character knows what an ordeal that it can be for people who have read an entire player's handbook. I imagine this is where many players lose their drive to play Baldur's Gate. The game gives you the option of two character genders, six races, a dozen or so classes, multiple subclasses for each class, and nine alignments. It then has you assign attribute roles that in D&D would have been obtained with dice. These are assigned to different attributes that change your character's physical and mental abilities. Then finally, you assign points to skills that affect how good your character is at a specific task or using specific weapons. The combinations are too many to consider for most people. Calling this character customization deep is an understatement. I've played D&D for 20 or so years on and off and across multiple editions of the game. I've played many other games that use D&D rules, and it's always an overwhelming and stressful process to create a character. If someone bought this game cold without knowing the framework of D&D, it's tough to imagine getting through this process. The light at the end of the tunnel, though, is that the game has some forgiveness built in. The game's difficulty is not made harder by requiring a specific build or precise stats for your character, but instead by understanding how to use the rules it gives you. I've seen people beat this game with a single character when it is meant for a party of six. They understand how to play the game, and it rewards them for it. If you find yourself with a character that isn't designed with a meta in mind, your strategy and party can make up for it. Don't let this screen scare you off. For my character, I made an elven ranger with a subclass of stalker. This class is a fighting character who is also able to stealth and perform a high damage backstab. 
This is most likely because I'm currently reading through the Legend of Drizzt series by R.A. Salvatore and wanted to channel the feeling of that character. I re-rolled my stats a few times to get a pretty good set of stats. To be honest, I wasn't looking for the hardest challenge in the world. I was more excited to experience the story and the exploration. I played on the normal difficulty setting, which I think was a good challenge. I probably could have gone a little harder, but the thought of a spell I just found not being successfully copied into my spell book sounded frustrating, and I didn't want to deal with that. Maybe for the sequel or another playthrough, I will bump up the difficulty. I chose an alignment of neutral good. For those unfamiliar with the D&D alignment system, it's definitely worth reading about. It has an axis that spans from good to neutral to evil, and from lawful to neutral to chaotic. These can be combined in many ways if you can imagine a 3x3 three three grid that would span across. Most people get good and evil, but lawful and chaotic are sometimes new concepts. To keep it simple, let's think of it like this. Lawful characters need order in the world and follow rules to maintain good or evil. Chaotic characters do not follow the rules, but still want good or evil respectively. Robin Hood would be chaotic good. There are some great articles and videos about it, and I highly recommend looking at one. I like playing good characters for a few reasons. I find it really natural to make decisions on the good alignment axis, but at the same time challenging to make these decisions. Evil decisions are usually inherently selfish. We make evil decisions for personal gain or for some other self-serving reason. Good decisions will make you weigh the costs to multiple parties and think through consequences. This is a challenge I really like in the narrative-driven games like Baldur's Gate. It is fun and interesting to think through multiple sides of a conflict and weed through the opinions of multiple people to find a decision that leads to the best outcome for all. This is in contrast to the typically evil decision of how can I personally benefit the most from this situation. I guess you could argue that an evil character could simply want to sow as much evil as possible regardless of how it affects them, but I have a hard time thinking that way myself, so I can't identify much with those choices. I guess my personal view of evil is selfish. Once you begin the game, you're put in the starting area candle keep. I'm going to try not to talk about the story specifics in this video, but instead what you're presented with in the starting area. You're given a simple task of going to meet your godfather, Garion, with him telling you to prepare to leave the keep. There is a sense of urgency. In the meantime, you're able to do the game's beginning side quests, all very simple, and talk with the scholars of the keep. These scholars serve as the introduction to many mechanics of the game. It breaks the narrative a little to have each scholar teaching you gameplay mechanics, but it's a forgivable design decision since it's your gateway to entry for the game. The consequence of starting you in an area like this is it's easy to get sidetracked and lose the drive towards your goal. The first thing the game has you do is choose if you want to explore and give you side quests. This is most likely an intentional choice. The game wants you to get lost and wander into many different adventures. It wants to give you the experience of exploring a new world with no idea what you will find. The game keeps track of your quests in a text-based log. When something happens in the quest, the log updates itself. It's a simple but effective method for quest tracking that outshines many modern games. Many modern games have an interactive map with markers, waypoints, quest tracking that allows you to highlight and display points of interest on your map, and somehow I found myself looking up things less in Boulder's Gate than many of those other games. When I didn't know where to go, I looked it up in my quest log, pulled up my map, and started an adventure. Many times I would get sidetracked or completely derailed, but I never felt like I was lost or frustrated. This is an extreme rarity for me, but in this game there were some quests I just ignored. It's odd to say this, but I mean that as a compliment towards Baldur's Gate. In many other games, you have a quest tracker that is more like a checklist. Especially games that integrated collectibles, repeating side quests, or other side content that rewards you for repetition. The difference with the content in these games is you know what to expect. In some games, you're told your reward before the quest even starts. It's there to entice you into completing the checklist. In others, you know that completing a certain number of quests will build towards the completion of some other goal of a checklist. In contrast with Baldur's Gate, you have no idea where a quest will lead you. Some tasks will be short and simple with a small or sometimes negligible reward. Some will take you to places you have never been before and lead you to other branching quests. I often found myself rewarded more by the adventure and the story I received in Baldur's Gate than any material reward. In other games, the metagame of the quest reward or the checklist was the goal. I think rewarding players with story is something more games should strive for. The gameplay and story itself should be motivation enough in these games. So let's get back to my earlier claim. Why was my ignoring of quests a compliment? Well, I have two answers. 
The first is that when playing Boulder's Gate, I found myself following my interests when looking at my quest log. I didn't ignore these quests because I knew the reward and I didn't want it. I ignored it because at the time it didn't interest me. Maybe in another playthrough or at another time those quests would have been interesting. The other experience that comes to mind with gameplay like this is the Witcher series. In both cases, the games kept me interested with their dialogue, quests, and lore. That interest gave me a sense of satisfaction no checklist ever could. The second area where me ignoring quests ends up being a compliment is that the game eventually broke me of my habit of needing to complete everything. I realized that in this game, it just isn't possible, and it's not designed to be possible to do everything. The game had a strong enough pull to keep me despite my need to see it all. This is coming from someone who often searches Google for missable items before deciding to buy a game or play one for my backlog. I'm glad I've had the experience with a game where I could play it and feel comfortable with knowing that I could use it to have an engaging and rewarding experience, not to stimulate the reward centers of my brain with short-term success highs. This choice overload has some major advantages. Achieving a golden boulder's gate usually has multiple paths to success. You can talk your way out of a situation, fight your way through it, or sneak right past it. It's possible to complete most quests in multiple ways. It's also possible to permanently fail a quest and never be able to complete it. This leads to each quest, or even the same quest with two different parties, feeling very open-ended and unique. It also makes the world feel very real. I want to explain one of these without spoiling too much of the story of the quest. For all intents and purposes, this is a small side quest. Right before entering Baldur's Gate, there's a group that gives you a quest to kill someone they think is causing them trouble. You go to talk to the troublemaker to find that their side of the story is equally compelling. Both groups are evil, neither has a convincingly good choice. I ended up choosing what I thought to be the lesser of two evils. I still don't know if I feel comfortable with the choice I made. If this were the philosophical trolley car experiment, I feel that there would be an equal number of people on each track. I found myself thinking about it into the next day, and that's the type of choice that makes games like this feel like an experience you can't get in any other form of media. Now, I don't want this retrospective to come off as fawning over a game with rose-colored glasses. Baldur's Gate is a great game, but it has its flaws nonetheless. I look back to when I was a kid, and I didn't just dislike this game because it was over my head. It had some barriers that are still there now, I think they have improved somewhat with the Enhanced Edition, but others are part of the design of the game in total. My first critique is the game's visuals. Before people bring up the point that this game is 22 years old, I get that. I'm really not critiquing the graphical fidelity, the resolution, or the frame rate. It's the art style and direction that I want to talk about. One other thing to keep in mind that skews my clarity on this topic. I'm playing the Enhanced Edition, which allows for scaling of resolution and upscaled many textures. This is thus partly a critique of the original game, but through the lens of that enhanced edition and its graphics. My problem with the game isn't that it's an old game, it's that it's a game that doesn't look as good as it could have for the setting and the time. Some of these can certainly be chalked up to the fact that the game originally ran at a very low resolution, and it was designed with this resolution in mind. Others, however, I see as a problem with this being a game from a studio with no prior experience designing games. The visuals are muddy. Again, I don't see this as a problem with the game's original resolution, but with its color palette and the way in which the design sometimes ignores depth, shadow, and perspective. The game is set on the Sword Coast, a lush forest with castles and villages, its idyllic fantasy in its most basic form. The problem here is that the game uses a very bland palette. There's not enough contrast between the different textures and colors that make up the backgrounds in these wooded areas. Because of this, they end up looking like a low-resolution Google Maps rendering of a forest. The world feels flat. Unfortunately, a large portion of the beginning of the game is made up of these wooded areas, and it feels like the developer simply repeated the same design for map after map after map. Villages have a similar muddy brown color palette, especially in the beginning areas of the game. Something that defines fantasy is that it takes the worlds we live in, or used to live in historically, and presents you with strange things happening in them. There's no indication of that in this color palette or in this design. It's instead a very washed out and bland representation of the world. There are often times in villages where there are homes next to each other that seem to bend the laws of physics. 
Now, this would usually be a positive in a fantasy setting, but here it's a problem of perspective. It seems like a problem that some buildings were designed with a slightly different perspective than others, like their lines aren't all drawn back to the same point as should be done to create a 3D world looked at from one angle. Many dungeons don't fare much better. One full of ankegs is a collection of brown muddy tunnels with little else to look at. The tunnels themselves seem in a random pattern that lends no sense of purpose. Two of the game's dungeons are in mines, and these are both fairly similar, with the same muddy brown textures and some additional mining equipment thrown in. Occasionally there's a treasure cache or a detail drawn in, but this is not the norm for these dungeons. I could see all of these dungeons improved with some play of the color palette, some lighting effects, or even some small background details. Not all areas are like this, however. It seems like some of the best visual content is at the end of the game. I'm not sure if this was intentional or something that occurred because the developers became more skilled as they designed. Even within the starting area of Candlekeep, you have a bland and somewhat stock fantasy theme, but later in the game, when you're given access to the inside of the keep itself, there's a beautifully realized area that is the library. Each floor is unique, and there's just an edge of color and visual highlighting that makes it feel like this is a special place unique in itself. The city of Baldur's Gate is a wonderfully designed place. It feels like here the visual style changes enough to make it feel like there's a real large sprawling town to explore. It reminds me of finally getting to Novigrad in The Witcher 3. You're suddenly overwhelmed with a dense and heavily embellished cityscape to explore. There's a wonderful hall that houses a wizarding shop. A group of buildings holds a seedy guild of thieves, a dock section with temples, even a museum holding all sorts of interesting lore. It fits that the namesake town of the game is one of the most exciting and interesting portions. This is a town that is teeming with life, excitement, and intrigue. The expansion content is where I think the developers really started to find a special visual style. There's a subtle change in lighting, an attention to small details, and a better focus on the overall theme that really makes for a visual appeal. A great example of this is Durlag's Tower. You get the sense from visiting the tower that something's very wrong. It seems like the landscape is dying, and there really is a sense of evil and dread that comes from these changes. The map of the outer portion of the tower highlights some key differences of design that change in the expansion. The path leading to the tower is a long stretch of territory that has sparse but tough battles. There are narrow chasms that your party has to venture over that create a sense of tension. Then you come to the gates of the tower, where the walls are often high enough to obscure your view in. Once you are in the tower, each floor feels unique. There are details that set the mystery of your mind running. Then you find the dungeons in its depths, and some truly bizarre and fantastical settings are realized. Looking ahead, this seems to be the art style that the studio stuck with for Baldur's Gate 2. It helps that by the time the team began developing Baldur's Gate 2, they were developing in the then-established Infinity Engine, and they had the experience of the first Baldur's Gate under their belt. They had also developed the graphically interesting Planescape, allowing them to spread their wings a little when it comes to developing surreal fantasy experiences. Baldur's Gate also has some flaws when it comes to gameplay. Although it's often called a computerized version of Dungeons & Dragons, there are a few ways in which they vary enough to cause problems. The most notable is that while D&D is a slow and turn-based system, Baldur's Gate is not. The style of Baldur's Gate is often called real-time with pause. This is a system that allows for a faster pace of combat with the continued ability to employ strategy and micromanagement of multiple party members. This changes the pace and the amount of combat that a player can get through at a time compared to D&D, but leads to some interesting problems. One obvious advantage of the system is it saves a lot of time. You're making decisions and things are happening for multiple party members simultaneously, as well as the decisions of your enemies. The pause allows you to take finer control when needed. In a purely turn-based game such as Dungeons & Dragons, or even computer games such as Divinity Original Sin, you select the character's actions, the animation plays, and then the control goes to the next player's turn. It's slow, but provides the highest level of control. Because of this, the pace of combat is often consistent, but slow. Each action feels more meaningful. With real-time with pause combat, there are times when you can just click your party into the next group of enemies and watch them die off. Tougher encounters may start with a pause, then have one every few seconds, and yet still come out faster than if it were turn-based. The advantage for the developers using the second edition AD&D rules was that you had all the complexity of the turn-based D&D system, the spells, the skills, and the abilities, 
but with a simpler overall output of gameplay. The player can then add complexity if desired by utilizing their spellcasters, cloaking their rogues, and buffing with your support characters, but it's not always necessary. The slower pace of D&D combat is made more interesting by a few things. For example, you can be descriptive in what's happening with your character. You can be creative with your environments, and you can use skills such as grappling or taking attacks of opportunity to make combat more interesting. This isn't included in the Baldur's Gate version of AD&D rules, since the faster pace would make it less practical. That being said, a full and overwhelming spell selection from both priest and mage spellbooks are available for the player. There were often times I would think, who would use this, because the spells were included from AD&D and not designed for this particular game. Some spells have uses that I wouldn't expect to have, such as surrounding a character with a bubble of immortality, not to save the character, but to make a blockade over a narrow chasm and a moving barricade. The availability of spells is quite nice and allowed me to come up with creative solutions in fights that I simply couldn't outpower or outmaneuver. The implementation of spellcasting in Baldur's Gate, however, has some pertinent downsides compared to Dungeons and & Dragons and other role-playing games. Again, these go back to visual problems. In many cases, it's hard to see where a spell is cast. There are certain encounters where a dimensional door is opened or a monster is summoned, and that's easy to see. Other times I wasn't even aware a spell had finished because of the lack of visual representation. While in real D&D there are no visuals to speak of, your imagination and the description from the people you play with allow you to create these visuals in your mind. This is especially problematic with area of effect spells. I often found myself nuking my own party members because I didn't know how big 15 feet would be in the game. I feel that this would have been possible with the technology at the time. They could have just expanded the cursor with a circle, cone, or line depending on the spell. In real D&D, you can simply measure or count squares to figure out where a spell would hit. I would also find myself memorizing spells in a way very different than I would have liked. I found myself only changing from a preset group of spells for my wizard when I had died, and then had to tailor my playstyle to win a fight. This made me uncomfortable at first because in D&D you have your spells memorized, and if you die, you die. The fight's over with. Here with the ability to save and load, you can experiment with your spells to overcome many different fights. I eventually started to like this because it made it a fun challenge to figure out what spells my priest and mage characters needed to memorize in order to win a fight. It was a fun challenge to learn the spell books, figure out what the enemy was doing, and try and outsmart the enemy with my choices. Once I became more comfortable with the fact that this wasn't D&D, but instead something of a similar system, I really started to enjoy the combat and the challenging fights the game had to offer. Even though it isn't the high-level content that is offered in Baldur's Gate 2, the endgame fights can be very challenging and rewarding to figure out. Again, the variability in ways to defeat some of these bosses really makes the game a fun experiment in tactics. One other pertinent difference between Baldur's Gate and D&D is the inventory management system. I found this to be one of the most tedious parts of the game, to be honest. I loved getting into a new dungeon and finding a cool new item. Unique magical items in this game are pretty rare, and it can change your gameplay a lot when you find something. My enthusiasm was then cooled when I found that I had to go in and figure out where to drop something else to make space in my inventory. There are two ways in which Baldur's Gate forces you to regulate your inventory, weight and space. Both of these make sense and somewhat fit into D&D gameplay. It also adds a sense of realism for what that's worth in a game filled with magic and interdimensional travel. Both subsystems of inventory regulation add challenge to some effect, and I see the need for both of them to be there in some form to stay true to the D&D roots, but this could have been mitigated to make it less frustrating. The weight portion doesn't bother me at all, but the space limitations cause a lot of issues. In D&D, some dungeon masters won't let you carry so many items that it wouldn't make sense how you could carry them all. In this game, if I have the spaces to do so, I could carry dozens of weapons and suits of armor or hundreds of potions. My guess is the idea of having a limited number of inventory slots was to prevent you from becoming a walking storage container. Diablo had a system where the larger items took up more space, and I think this could have been utilized instead. Then characters can carry many small items or a few large items. You could still limit space and just make the inventory management a little bit faster and a little more intuitive. I was trying very hard not to be a hoarder in this game, and it didn't do me much good. One of my complimentary goals in playing this was to use more consumable items when the time was appropriate. I usually make my way through a game not using consumables in an effort to save them for when I really need them. 
I then finished the game feeling like I didn't need them. In Baldur's Gate, I found myself sometimes needing just a little edge to get through a fight, and tried using potions and the occasional scroll to push through. I still found myself balancing keeping a valuable item or a useful one, and it didn't seem like the kind of fun balancing either. Items will stay on the ground, so I would occasionally just drop things on the ground and then come back for them later to sell. Another nice inclusion would have been a later game option to buy a horse and wagon or bags of holding, both of which are in D&D. I could see some interesting random traveling encounters where you have to defend your wagon, but I could see why that would add a whole other layer of development that they wouldn't have had time for. Right-clicking an item to send it to someone would have been nice too, instead of dragging it to the character with the right bag. These things may have changed the game just too much, but the inventory management is by far the least satisfying level of difficulty in the game. From what I understand, the Enhanced Edition did a few nice things to reduce how much this impacted gameplay. There are some items such as the gem bag that usually was only available in Baldur's Gate 2. The Enhanced Edition also increases the inventory of these bags to 100 items instead of just 20. The scroll case I got from a quest that I did early on in Baragas that was extremely easy. Just a fetch quest. The gem bag I got from having Nira in my party. I'm not sure what you're supposed to do if you don't choose to quest with Nira, but I guess she is neutral and could fit into most parties. An evil party may just kill her for the bag. I didn't realize until I had almost beaten the game, including the long side dungeon Durlag's Tower, that there was also a potion case available. This would have really helped to get early on, and it was just in a shop that I had been to many times before and missed. I'm sure these saved me many trips back and forth and made it less likely for me to have to make decisions about whether I should keep a gem or a potion. It did, however, lead me to clicking through many sub-menus of my bags to put items into my main inventory, since the inventory space is limited. I can only put a few things in my inventory at once, so I would then click in the bag, empty out a few more, repeating until I could finally sell everything. Then repeat with scrolls and later potions. This became quite tedious, and I sometimes found my shorter worknight play sessions would occasionally just turn into me doing item processing in a town. Even though I was trying not to be a hoarder, I still felt myself with too much gold at the end of the game. Everything felt a little deflated, and money felt like it wasn't a big reward. Devaluing many items would reduce how much gold you had at the end of the game, and gave players an incentive to only carry what was truly valuable to their gameplay. By the end of the game, I found myself buying out entire stores and still having leftover funds. The other loops of gameplay, however, are very satisfying. When you're out in the wild, exploring can be a real joy. Drab environments aside, removing the fog of war from a map is a rewarding experience, and each map is full of enemies, interesting characters, and side quests to slow down your exploration and give you a sense of discovery. Occasionally I found myself just clearing a map for the sake of having all the fog gone, but this mostly was to make sure I didn't miss any interesting content. Sometimes I would find it prudent to scout ahead with my rogue and my stealth ranger and plan out an attack on a particularly nasty group of enemies. I have one nitpick about my scouting missions. I wish there was a way to roll a virtual perception check around enemies. There were many times in the game that I wanted to know what an enemy was. I feel that some of the characters in the game would have had been experienced enough to know what these enemies were. In the Final Fantasy series, you can cast a spell called Libra to find out some information on an enemy, and in D&D you can usually roll a check to gain this information. Something like this would have made my scouting missions far more worthwhile. Later on in my gameplay, I started using the Reveal Details toggle to show the names of my party, also realizing that it revealed the names and types of enemies, as well as highlighting doors and storage containers. Part of me wishes that I had found this earlier, but part of me feels like it breaks immersion. It is a toggle, though, so I guess the choice is yours. In one area east of Baragos, there are a large number of basilisks. Before finding this toggle, I ended up rolling headfirst into a group of two basilisks, and my main character was immediately turned to stone. I didn't realize what had happened, I just got the clawed hand of death and reloaded my save. I guess I could have checked the chat log at the bottom of the screen, but then again, hindsight's 20 20. The next time I cloaked my rogue and ranger and sent them to get a look. I saw this odd looking blob with what looked like multiple legs, but no part of me knew it was a basilisk. When I went to sneak attack it again, it turned most of my party to stone and I died. This time I realized it was a basilisk petrifying me, so I did what anyone with that knowledge would do. I had my mage memorize six copies of protection from petrification and steamrolled the little lizards. 
A perception check telling me what this enemy was could have saved me from feeling like I had to die and then tailor my spell book to beat an area. It would also make the game feel more balanced in that I'm finding out what a type of creature is organically instead of just toggling the reveal details button. It would have felt more like what adventurers would do to overcome an obstacle. I'm sure it was told by some town person at some point, beware the basilisks east of Baragost, but that could have been 20 or 40 hours earlier in my playthrough, or the way I play months apart. This was a small part of exploration though, and one of the only negative exploring experiences I had like this. Dungeon exploration is also an interesting loop. I found some dungeons in the game to be really interesting. The mines in Noshkul presented me with some interesting choices and ended in a way that I really didn't expect. It pushed me to make decisions outside of my party. When exploring in dungeons, there's a tension knowing that you don't have the safety of an inn to get back to. This though leads me to one other gameplay element that I didn't much like. When you rest in the game, there's always a chance of getting into a random encounter unless you're at an inn. This meant that you couldn't always rest when your party was especially beat up. I think the point is that you're supposed to plan your adventures, conserve supplies, and use rest sparingly. I did not follow this, instead just quick saving and resting. If I couldn't survive the fight that came from rest, I would just reload the save and try resting again. Eventually I just got to the point where I would reload any time there was an encounter with resting. I'm not proud of this save scumming, but it took a lot of tedium out of the game for me. In a real D&D game, the dungeon master can see if the party is really in bad shape and choose to let them rest in peace. In Baldur's Gate, your dungeon master is the cruel roll of the dice, and I found most of the time resting led me to an encounter I couldn't survive. I'd like the idea of a finite resource that let me rest without worrying, similar to tents in the Final Fantasy games. A lot of these problems can be traced back to the main difference between D&D and computer games. Each gives the player an advantage that the other cannot have. The dungeon master is a person capable of making on-the-fly decisions. The computer makes merciless dice rolls. The main advantage of a dungeon master in a tabletop game is that they can tailor the experience on the fly. If one day your players are feeling fearless, you can bring them down a peg by killing one of them. If they're feeling clever, you can feed into that and give them a good challenge. But say they're all worn out from a long work week, you can have a very casual play session that lets them unwind. In Baldur's Gate, you never know what to expect because there's no point of reference. The game is well referenced at this point. If you're frustrated with an encounter or a dungeon, you can simply look up the solution on a wiki or a forum. There are methods to beat almost anything. You can't know what a dungeon master is thinking. Neither is bad, but I will say having a sentient dungeon master is a lot less frustrating. If your dungeon master likes you, that is. The story of Baldur's Gate is not just the story of you and your character. The story as your character is simple enough. You go on your quest and you have your own goals. You end up hearing the stories of many people you meet along the way and of the world itself. Some of these even include quests to help your party members by giving insight into their background. The common consensus is that the story of Baldur's Gate is well done, if not slightly heavy towards the end. There's a minimal story in the beginning to allow the player to explore side missions, build a party, and start developing a relationship with the world slowing the story pace down. Then it seems like you hit a point where things snowball in pace and you get large amounts of information all at once. I didn't dislike this though. I've been doing a lot of other quests at this point, so having the larger quests take back over was a welcome change. There's lore spread throughout the game. This lore is found in books and in scrolls of parchment, as well as told by its inhabitants. I found myself paging through a lot of these books and seeing how all things fit within the larger Forgotten Realms. I think this is a nice way for someone who isn't as familiar with the realms to get a sense of the backstory. It's all optional though for those who don't want to read it. A lot of the story revolves around multiple political groups and a power struggle that the character isn't at first directly involved in. There's a looming threat of war and multiple points of subterfuge which is creating increased tension. I like seeing how my story eventually intertwined in this conflict. Here again I like that the game made me figure things out on my own. I think it was sometimes limited by my reading comprehension, as most of the game's story is through text and dialogue trees. I enjoyed piecing together clues and trying to figure out what was happening and who the major players were. Some of the twists in the game were unexpected, and I enjoyed thinking back to my past experiences and questioning what had really happened after the twist. It's another time where I was left thinking about the game for long after I had turned it off. 
The expansion also offers more side quests that I found were interesting enough to keep me engaged. The sign of a good game for me is that by the time I'm nearing the end, am I still interested in the side content? The Tales of the Sword Coast content I found to be still worthy of my time and my energy. In fact, one of the biggest highlights of the game for me was Durlag's Tower. This massive dungeon not only provides you with an interesting and deep story with many twisting layers, it also makes you learn the story and understand the motives of the people in the tower to fully beat it. It was the highlight of the game for me. Some people have voiced their dislike of the new content in the Enhanced Edition. I really didn't mind it at all. I think it may not feel like it fits in with a game that people remember, but I don't remember the game, so I might not have the right context to make that judgment. I think it's well integrated enough to blend in, and I enjoyed much of it. I had Nira in my party for most of the game, and I really enjoyed her side quests. I did notice that the art in these areas was more updated and didn't fit in with the original style. They took what could have been another boring cave in which you fight enemies and added things to make it much more visually interesting. I think Beamdog did a great job at taking new content and trying to blend it into a much older game. I want to note that I'm not including Siege of Dragonspear here. I plan on looking at that in a separate video. I'm trying to be vague about the story because I want to encourage people to experience it for themselves. If you're interested, it is a good fantasy story that avoids some tropes but uses others to make you feel comfortable. They may only feel like tropes because D&D has been around for so long and become more popular. The Enhanced Edition has a story mode that removes most if not all of the difficulty from combat. If you want the story and don't care for the gameplay, I think story mode could be worth a playthrough, or I guess a read-through in that case. Overall, I really enjoyed my time with Baldur's Gate. I'm glad I finally found the time to play it and gave it the chance I couldn't as a teenager. Although I have dabbled with a few other isometric RPGs in the past, this is the first that I ever played to this depth. I think writing this script and making this video has only enhanced my experience and made me look deeper at the things that I liked and disliked about the game. I never thought writing long-form essays about things would excite me, but here we are. Although a large portion of the video is critical, I'm only critical because it is a game I think is worth the effort. Is this a game for everyone? Not at all. If you like story-driven games, tactical combat, or overall well-rounded RPGs, then absolutely you should play it. Don't let the graphics and older gameplay systems turn you off. Take the time to learn and appreciate them, and I hope you'll have the rewarding experience that I had. Please leave your feedback, thoughts, and ideas down in the comments, and if you like the video, please hit the like button. Conversely, if you hated it, hit the dislike button and tell me how I can improve. Constructive feedback is always welcome. I'm planning to do more critique videos such as this one, some shorter review and commentary type videos, some tech content, and maybe some vlogs. If any of that interests you, subscribe or follow me on social media. Thanks for watching.